Not be outside in the night sometime. Mm -hmm. It's beginning of summer, so it's going to be like this, so it's going to be home. So before we start, you're going to be working to make knowledge of the full safety tools of the vanish structure and share all the support that I can find within the vanish where a few other vanish for others and not a few matches. Okay, so it's a, it's a pleasure for me to move back from Fort Road. Uh, as you can see, it says associate professor, so congratulations to George, she just got promoted a few weeks ago. So, very fun. Uh, what's interesting about George's career is that he actually has his leg, two legs in different areas, right? So, he did a BA in biology, then he did a master's in marine biology, and then a PhD in oceanography, so, might nice be interdisciplinary. And then a postdoc at the Monterey Gay Aquarium Research Institute. And uh, what's also interesting is that he taught courses both in the Atlantic and the Pacific, and so it became very widely, widely diverse. Uh, he taught 20 different courses, well, not 20 courses, but 20 different courses, a very interesting title, like Climate Change and Ways of Change, I like that one, Animal Behavior, Island Ecology. Uh, and then introductory courses in marine ecology, a writing seminar, introductory invertebrate uh, biology, and all sorts of other things. He supervised 2,500 value research projects, and 30% of those actually were published, so those publications are actually with under barriers. He was active in curriculum design and revision, uh, and has about 30 publications at the date on climate change, ocean acidification, ways of species, and carbs dropping off the lakes. Right? <laughs> that's, that's what we were talking about this morning. Uh, and today he's going to talk about really the play relationship and course based research. And maybe I very, should very briefly mention the instructions he gave the review candidates, the choices of candidates, as I said, for the marine biology. Uh, Teaching faculty position, so we gave the instructions to both those to give a 15 minute teaching demonstration, then a 30 minute vision for teaching and curriculum and what he wants to do. So, thank you very much, George. Thanks for coming. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, as Lorenz mentioned, the first part is going to be sort of focused on. Um, what would be a part of one class um, that's presumably an upper level class? Um, sometimes with the teaching demos, you see people sort of like, as we learned last class, and I, between not knowing how many people are going to be here and who's going to be here, I'm not going to like pretend you're an actual class. Um, but I'll sort of talk a little bit about, you know, what this would look like in an actual class and then um, talk about the topic a little bit as well. And so um, the topic I'll sort of focus on is predator prey relationships. And if this is an upper level course, then it's probably not going to be just like a list of examples of, of different types of predator prey relationships or things like that, but more focused on sort of understanding the different ways that predators and prey interact with the goal ultimately that students would be able to come out of it, like being able to look at say a novel system and say, okay, let's have this prey that I know nothing about. And let's say there's a new predator coming in from somewhere else. What are possible ways these could interact? What ecological impacts could this have? Um, and actually be able to you know, design experiments and think about the ways that this could sort of manifest itself instead of just saying, well, we didn't learn that specific thing in class. Um, so if this was a normal class, um, for most of my courses, there's something that students will have to do in advance. And that's partly because um, to try to level the playing field a little bit coming in, often we have students with a wide, pretty much every topic you focus on, students that some will be like, oh, I learned about this in my other class, or I learned about this in high school, not as much for an upper level class, but um, so that a video or an article related to the subject or something like that, the students would watch in, or read in advance. And then a little quizzes, a little mini quiz about it, I call it. It's not worth very many points, but it ensures that they do it and that they think about the topic a little bit in advance. So then, then when class starts, we can, you know, I can pose questions that I know they should have some inkling of the answer to, or we can talk about topics that they have a little bit of background in. Um, we would start with a review of what we did in the previous class. I'm obviously not going to do that and would do some sort of group or class activity as well, but that probably wouldn't in a normal class take about 10 or 15 minutes. And so I'm not going to say get into groups and do this, and then I won't do anything. I won't touch that again. Okay. 
So some of the goals, I love this picture. I always think it's like the look on the student's face if you come in and there was an exam you hadn't realized that was happening. Um, obviously these aren't marine animals, but I think one of the um, sort of themes is that when you're looking at a lot of this ecological stuff, it should transcend environments. And so um, some of the goals coming out of this would just be that students would be able to understand the, I guess, difference and be able to give examples of like direct effects of predation versus indirect effects. Um, they would be able to understand some of the impacts that predators can have on prey populations at really large scales, and then think about all this from an evolutionary perspective as well and explain how a certain behavior might have evolved. We'll talk about some of the reasons that that would be useful. So a lot of the sort of ecological focus on predators is trying to explain patterns that we see. So even if you walk around outside here, I mean, well, here everything's sort of planted in an intentional way. But if you're in a very natural environment and you think about, oh, this is here, why is this here? Why is it like this? And often the thing that you might think of as well, it's probably best suited to that environment. Um, Maybe it is, maybe that's where it can survive, or maybe that's where it can avoid predators, or maybe that's where it's, you know, um, been carried by the currents or by the winds or whatever. And so if you see examples like these little fake shrimp populations, I'd say some of these have genetic differences between others. Some are more or less diverse. Some have different size structures. I like to think of as ecology as sort of answering the question, why? Um, why is it like this? And so predator-prey dynamics are often one of the things that are influencing the way that um, we view some of these patterns. So if we think about direct effects of predators, that's probably what most people think of, like a predator actually eating something and therefore causing a decline in the population. Um, there's some pretty well-known local examples of that. Um, what are ways anyone here can think of that predators can influence prey other than by eating them? Yeah. Fear. Fear. Okay. So if prey are afraid, they are, what, what might this change about their behavior or their physiology or anything? Stay hidden. Okay. So they could go out foraging less. They might stay in one location more. This could have trophic level consequences, right? Because you could have, um, if this is an herbivore, like a snail that's staying in one spot, they're going to have less impact on. Um, the surrounding algae. You can actually see that effect from um, satellites around coral reefs. Yeah. They'd be stressed. Okay. And so their stress could also manifest itself in a lot of different ways. So stress could mean higher metabolic rates or higher susceptibility to disease or something like that. Um, other ways they could be influenced. Yeah. More right, so it could change their reproductive strategy or their life history strategy, for sure, so they could reproduce a lot more or reproduce earlier. Um, if you think about like dandelions or something like that, that are just like grow fast, reproduce quickly. Um, we've seen that with fish, of course, as there's been a lot of heavier fishing pressure. That's been the like natural driving factor that's been forcing some species of fish to reproduce at earlier sizes and earlier in life. Um, and so the answer to the second question is pretty much an obvious one, which is if you have a predator that's eating a lot of a prey, that's going to be an extremely strong selective pressure that's going to favor any sort of anti-predator behavior. So one way and one place that students or people in general, I guess, are able to see the impacts of sort of species interactions all in one spot is in the rocky intertidal zone. Um, this isn't Washington, it's Oregon, but you could see the same thing out on the outer coast here. And if you think about the different zones here, we're not going to get into a whole like intertidal ecology thing here, but you can see that they're very visually different. And this is, I think, one of the value of field courses is, I can talk about this a lot in a classroom, but if you take someone out to the environment and say, all right, where can you find this type of animal? Where can you find this type of animal or plant or algae? Um, they're pretty quickly going to realize what some of these patterns are, where you can find these different things. And when you say, why do you think that there might be more barnacles up in the high zone? Um, you could propose a lot of different theories. Maybe that's where they prefer to live. Maybe they need to be out of the water for a long period of time for some reason. 
Um, but even just looking at it visually here, you might say, okay, well, maybe they get out competed by sea anemones or they can't live near the kelp or the sea stars are eating them. And so you start to see, and you can't see whelks, but there's snails everywhere too that are potentially eating them. And so um, what are some ways that you could think that you might be able to test, figure out why are these barnacles only living in the high zone? How could you figure out whether they could live somewhere else? Yeah. You could move them. All right. So if I move them down here and they all died, that maybe could tell me whether they could survive theoretically down there. If I move them down there and put a cage around them and protect them from everything else, and then they survive, then this tells us a lot more about what's actually limiting them. And in a lot of cases, not just in intertidal, but that's um, a great example, things are living in the area where they're not getting eaten or the area where they're not getting out competed, not necessarily in their ideal habitat. And that sort of flips on end often the way that people sort of think about where organisms live, because we think about much like humans, I guess, you say, where are you going to live? It's like, well, I can't afford to live there. I'd love to live there, but I can't afford to. Or I'd love to live there, but there's not a job. In this case, they would get a lot more food and grow a lot faster if they were living down here, but they would get eaten or outcompeted. So a large scale, more um, oceanographic example of this is in the Black Sea, when you had all of a sudden in the late 1980s, a huge collapse of the anchovy fishery, which was um, supporting many ports in different countries around the Black Sea. And all of a sudden in one year, it dropped about 75%. Um, and that coincided with an invasive species with this tinafore or comb jelly nemeopsis coming in, this little guy. And so guesses on why the anchovy populations just dove down when nemeopsis was introduced, likely from ships accidentally. They could be and were competing for the same zooplankton prey. Yeah. The boards were eating. Almost. Yeah, the, the smaller larvae and the eggs as well. So they're, um, it's not always like direct effects or indirect effects. In this case, both at once cause this massive decline. Um, do any of you, some of you may just know this, but um, guesses on what happened almost immediately thereafter that the anchovies went right back up, Nemeopsis went down. Another invasion, coincidentally, although this has happened in two places and there's thought that maybe the second one was intentional. Um, another tinafore. So this is Nemeopsis. This is our little shimmering uh, one that's eating eggs and competing with the anchovies. In Baroe, this other tinafore was introduced. And their favorite food <laughs> is Nemeopsis. Impressively so. And this is, even though it wasn't intentional, an impressive case of biological control that actually worked and didn't get out of hand because they have very specialized diet. Um, and so I love watching those things eat them, especially the really big ones. But they caused a complete flip in the um, ecosystem, like you could see here. Within a few years, Nemeopsis was basically gone again. Within 10 years, it was completely gone. Um, and the anchovy populations bounced right back up. This is not what usually happens with invasive species, but in this case, it worked out pretty well. All right, we have a local one that probably doesn't have to be explained at all in terms of large scale consequences here. Um, in areas where there's no sea otters, there's way too many sea urchins. And then when the sea otters are present, they keep the urchins under control. And actually, one of the cool things that's been going on at Friday Harbor is dealing with the other predator, major predator of sea urchins, um, and that's the sunflower stars. So we saw a similar thing um, really all along the West Coast with the sea star wasting disease. When sunflower star populations crashed, the urchins went way up even more than they already were from the lack of otters. Um, and like I know the places I took field courses in Oregon, you pretty much just have, you can't walk without stepping on the sea urchins in the low intertidal zone because the sunflower stars are no longer there to keep them under control. 
And so you get this large um, trophic cascade here where you can even add the orcas in here in areas in Alaska where the orcas are eating the sea otters that keeps their populations down, which causes increases in these and decreases in these. So these are all direct effects. And then when you start to think about where things are living and whether that's the ideal environment or not, this is another great example of this, where it's, this is a sea palm. They've evolved to live in really wave exposed areas. And again, it's not because they necessarily couldn't live in sheltered areas, but this little guy here is a limpet and limpets and snails love to eat these. If you put these in any seawater tank, they immediately get devoured by snails and things like that. And so like a lot of these um, defenses that we'll talk about, it's really an energetic balance. What am I gonna, and again, they're not actively thinking like, what am I gonna spend my energy on today? But they're thinking, okay, they're not thinking. They are in an evolutionary context, allocating energy towards one thing or another. In this case, if they live in exposed areas, they don't have to spend energy on chemical defenses um, because most of the snails and the limpets can't live in these exposed habitats. And therefore they just get blasted off of them even though that these can survive there. And so it's another example of something living primarily, or in this case, exclusively in areas where they're not um, best suited to it, but their predators can't survive there. All right, so we'll talk about a couple other examples of ways that things are not going to actually, like on a large scale, avoid their predators, and they're not going to, you know, like the sea urchins get completely wiped out or the kelp, and depending on the environment. They could avoid things with just active crypsis or hiding from their predators. Octopuses are probably one of the best marine examples of this. It's actually playing, it's just showing their active and sudden color change here. There's a bunch of these that are gonna play. I'll just sort of talk as it's going. So each one of these, it's going to free, the screen is gonna stop and you can see if you can even spot the octopus and then it'll back up a little bit. So what would be the advantage of being able to do this in terms of the habitats that it could live in? It contains text, texture and color. Yeah. It broadens the, the, the substrate they can live on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they can live in all sorts of different places, whether they have lots of predators or not, depending not as worried about the substrate, you'll see another defense behavior there. Um, so it broadens the types of places that they can live and how adaptable they are because they don't have to be like perfectly matched. Um, I'm not sure if any of you know the example here. These are obviously not marine, but these are peppered moths. And these in England in the, um, around the time of the Industrial Revolution, almost all of them were white. So they were this sort of white or speckled version here. And they lived primarily on birch trees. And then the Industrial Revolution came along. And then within just a couple decades, almost all of them were black. And it's because the soot from all of the factories and everything like that made a lot of the trees look more like this. And you can imagine if there's a bird predator, it's going to go from this one being really obvious and getting eaten at a really high weight rate to this one being really obvious and getting eaten at a really high rate. And so this is like, oh, well, maybe it was a coincidence that it happened at the same time. But then we have the sort of natural experiment of a lot of sort of clean air, clean water legislation in the 1960s. And you started to see it shift back again. And so as the air got cleaned up, um, these started to become more and more common. And so when you have these really strong predator prey relationships, you can get evolution happening at a really rapid time scale, just over a couple of generations even. All right, so these ones are intentionally, well, we assume intentionally, um, signaling to predators. They are not even trying to blend in. Um, I imagine that a bunch of you probably know why they're doing this. You wanna share? Why are they brightly colored? We'll probably know what these two are, at least. Are you smiling? <laughs> Yeah. Yes. 
And so um, a lot of sponges that are brightly colored, that's one theory for why they are um, so brightly colored. These can actually eat um, Portuguese man o' war and then incorporate their stinging cells into them. And so they're, it's in their benefit to signal, in this case, the blue ringed octopus, lionfish, that they're toxic and avoid predators that way um, or avoid being eaten in that way. They don't really have to avoid their predators. All right, and then we think about probably the thing that's most obvious, which is just, if you said, how does something avoid predators? You'd say, well, they run away. Um, but even that gets more complicated than you would initially imagine because everything's making this decision, whether it's an active one or just sort of something that's innate. But basically, when should they run? Should they run as soon as they sense any predator around or are they um, basically constantly assessing whether they should go or not? Um, so what would be some of the advantages of not being very responsive to predators of let's saying, oh, I see a predator over there. I'm going to, I'm going to ignore it for a little while. Why would that evolve? Why wouldn't everything just run the second it sees a predator? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you see a lot of organisms that do that, that they will just sort of freeze or stand still. They might be more of a moving, well, literally moving target. Okay, yeah, if they started sprinting off every time they see something, sort of like you see groundhogs do, um, that's gonna cause them to waste a lot of energy if they do that every time they get startled. Yeah. Yeah, so presumably whether they're looking for mates or eating or whatever it is, again, it's this energetic balance. If they're spending more time eating and less time running away from predators, as long as they don't get eaten, that's a win. They get a lot more energy. They can therefore reproduce more, theoretically have um, more offspring and become a greater proportion of the gene pool. And so one of the things that's sort of cool about a lot of this behavioral stuff is it lets you learn a lot about the predators as well and what they're most susceptible to. So without doing like an in-depth study of feeding rates and diet for a lot of different organisms, you could say, all right, if you have um, this groundhog, whatever this thing is here, how do they respond to different types of predators? And so if they are running the second they see one predator and pretty much ignoring another one, you can, I mean, probably don't wanna definitively assume it, but you can probably assume that they're not very worried about that one, that it's not a major, um, source or not a major threat. So we'll talk about that more in a second. All right, so sort of winding up with um, another way that people or that organisms can think about avoiding predators. So um, what sort of ways can they sense a predator? Okay, so they could smell it. Yeah. Visual. Sound, sound is, I feel like um, the acoustics people, if there's any of you here might disagree, but um, I feel like understudied element of how um, organisms, marine organisms are communicating or sensing things. Okay, changes in pressure. Okay, can't see who said that, but theoretically, um, especially in, um, I don't know about marine exam or marine examples, but like a lot of reptiles are sensing heat. Okay, it's different chemical cues. Yeah, this could be in the water. It could be in um, the air, obviously, for a um, something that doesn't live in the water. And basically, the more sensitive they are, the quicker it lets them respond. So visual cues is great, but there's obviously a limit to that, um, especially if you're living in pretty murky water, you're not going to be able to respond to something. Um, and so cues let them have a longer term sense, presumably as well. So they, with some larvae, they'll avoid areas that have like really strong cues of their predators. Um, you get inducible defenses as well, which we haven't talked about, but animals producing say thicker shells or more chemical defenses in algae if they have um, predator cues around. And so one of the ways I want to sort of finish up with this because it lets you, um, I guess, see the value of studying some of this, not just to like understand predator-prey relationships, but also see the ecological consequences of it. Um, all these guys here are predators of rabbits. And so this is an example from Australia. So this study was looking at 
rabbit responses to different predators. And so I forget who said it, but someone earlier was basically saying, okay, when they're threatened, they're going to sort of hunker down and not go out as much. And so you see for um, the ferrets and the foxes, and I don't know why that doesn't say cat, but it should say cat. Um, for all three of those, they are, or all three of those rather, they are drastically reducing their activity. And so there's no significant difference between any of those. Compared to the control, I don't honestly know what the um, daily activity rate um, scale is, but basically they're drastically decreasing their activity here. But to the coal here, they are not. It's basically the same as the control. And so what's interesting about this is this is an example in Australia, as I mentioned. Um, rabbits are invasive in Australia. And all of these are, all three of these are found in their native range. And so typically we think about um, species maybe not responding to an invasive predator. In this case, the prey is invasive. And the three predators that they're responding to are the cats, which are in Europe and wherever else the rabbits came from, as are ferrets, as are foxes. But the quolls are just in Australia. And so the rabbits are not responding to them. And so you've seen actually a pretty drastic increase in the number of rabbits getting eaten by these because they haven't evolved a response to them. And so without doing, again, a diet study or like some sort of caging experiment or long-term observations of um, what proportion of rabbits are getting eaten by different things, or just looking at their responses and being able to draw some conclusions about sort of their evolutionary history and um, the, in this case, their invasion history as well. And so you can see a lot of that in areas where there's like progressing biological invasions, like on the East Coast, the spread of um, Asian shore crabs and green crabs in Maine and New England has been um, pretty clearly documented largely by the snail responses as well. So when they first move in there, the snails will have no response to the new invader. And now the ones in Northern New England respond pretty strongly to green crabs and not as much to Asian shore crabs, but um, again, when you get a strong predation pressure, you get a strong um, response as well. All right, so if this, were, again, if this were a normal class, we'd do some sort of activity thing now. But as it is, I'm going to pivot and talk about curriculum stuff. And the instructions were to talk a little bit about the experience and everything that I have as well along these lines. And so I can't in you know 30 minutes talk about everything that I think about teaching and about course design and curriculum design but two of the main things that I want to focus on is the importance of sort of focusing on concepts that can hopefully give people a way to you know learn things that can be applied in multiple environments multiple habitats multiple courses and also course-based undergraduate research and so this doesn't necessarily mean like an entire you know master's level project and in, baked into a, a course, but some level of understanding of the scientific process that students are able to go through um, is something that I incorporate into all of my courses, um, regardless of size, at least in the lab component there. And so I've taught several different field courses, as Lorenz said, on both coasts. Um, I've taught them in Maine and like this um, treacherous mud flat here. And then in Oregon, and I've got potential ones to um, Ireland, and I'm still at my current institution. And um, next March, we'll be taking one to Jamaica as well to do coral reef things. And so these field experiences are really my favorite part of my current job. And so being able to have that be like basically um, the entire job at Friday Harbor would be amazing. Um, and I didn't know Lorenz was going to go through a list of a lot of these things already, so I'm not obviously going to give the list here either, but I've developed a whole bunch of different courses. Um, I think certainly my philosophy has evolved a lot over time, and the fact that I've developed all of these means that each time it's been sort of um, slightly different philosophy, slightly different structure, and so I'm going to give um, some examples of that here. All right, so this is an actual example. Um, I think UW can, uses Canvas as well, right? So um, we use Canvas too. Obviously, these have really creative file names. Um, but 
that's not the main point. Um, so I want to go through, this is like one week of class. So I'd have Canvas modules set up for one for each week. And this is for an intro bio class, not an upper level one like um, I was talking about before. I'll show an upper level one in a second. But this is for a large, again, large by my standards is 70 people, not a thousand like some of the classes here, but um, a large class where that was intended for incoming biology majors with a wide degree of um, variance in their basically backgrounds with science. And so we pull the students coming in, you know, I think it was about 50% have used a microscope before. Um, I think 30% know a scientist, like all sorts of things that give them some, you know, context for what science is going to be like. And so with this wide range of students, that's a challenging group to teach. And I don't think, I think some of the, um, they're not here, so I'll just um, talk about those other places at my institution. Some are like, okay, let's put in a lot of prerequisites because that variance is really difficult to teach and they're going to get more out of it if I can teach like just the ones that are really prepared. Um, we think that we're going to lose a lot of students that way, some who are probably have done well otherwise. And so we're sort of trying to design, or in this case, I am trying to design the course that sort of levels that playing field as much as possible. And so if you had a typical week like this, you can see um, the way that I most recently redesigned the class was each week is one major theme. And if they can understand that major theme in biology, we're gonna hit it like several different ways. We're gonna review it. And then they should be able to understand it and apply it. Um, it cuts a little bit down on the number of things I can cover, but I don't think that there's a whole lot of value in covering something if it won't be remembered, it won't be understood. So um, we sort of focused it like one week per major concept. In this case, photosynthesis and respiration were the major concept. And so, like I mentioned in the sort of theoretical sample class a minute ago, they would watch a video in advance. There's a little mini quiz to make sure they watch the video. They could do the mini quiz a couple times. So if you have a student who like, oh, I remember all that from high school, they can just zip through and take the quiz and whatever. If there's a student who doesn't have that background, they can take time, go through it a couple times, try to learn a little bit more about it, and then presumably come into class when we're going to talk about it on a similar level to the other students. And so um, it makes the class a lot more productive in that way. These were just, this is my PowerPoint, it doesn't really matter. Um, we had a review activity where they filled in diagrams for the different parts of photosynthesis and respiration. We then had an in-class activity with these are the answers to it, but again, about photosynthesis and respiration. And so I'm not obviously gonna like click on this and go into it in great detail, but this is sort of the typical structure for that sort of introductory level class. Pick another week, again, the cell cycle, mitosis, meiosis was the, the focus here. Same sort of thing, videos about each they could watch in advance, um, mini quizzes to make sure that they did it and um, sort of assess it to some degree. Another value of the mini quiz is not just like assessment, like give them a grade, but assessment for, okay, I need, I can then know if 90% of the class got this one right and 60% got this one right. I know that when in class we're doing activities and we're re reviewing, I know what I can spend more time on or less time on. And it sort of lets me have a finger on the pulse of the class a little bit more. Um, and then again, we have different types of reviewing. And so why structure a course this way? Again, it was largely a, re a redesign in an effort to, um, again, level the playing field a little bit. I think that while it's useful to um, cover as much as possible in an introductory course, if students are basically at the same, um, not, not the same level, like they learn nothing, but the same level relative to their classmates going out of the course, and we sort of just raised everybody's level up, but they still have those same differences, um, then that, especially as an introductory course, didn't really do its job. And so one plus is that it gives students a lot different, a lot of different ways to engage with the material. We don't just have, there are some students who are gonna do best in a lecture setting, um, especially if they're really used to it. There are some that are going to do much better when we do group activities. There are some who are gonna talk a lot in a small group and not talk at all in front of the whole class, especially when you got, a thousand or even 50 or even 20. And so having this be small groups and then larger groups um, will facilitate involvement. Some of them are gonna sort of watch that video again and again until they fully understand it. And some of them are gonna skim through it while they're doing something else um, in the background. 
and but it provides a lot of different opportunities for students to engage with it. Um, then one of the measures that I look at, and I'm sorry to the grad students because I talked about this earlier, um, but one of the measures that we look at is the mobility. And so basically this is the idea that if all the students have an incoming level going in and then they all increase, but they don't, none of those lines cross, none of the students that were sort of towards the bottom moved up towards the top, they all just increase. And I then basically I just perpetuated whatever differences there were at the beginning and move that forward. And so I'm going to say, okay, well, the students were who were best in and had the most opportunities and whatever else as a 17 year old in high school are going to keep getting moved to the top. And then the next year's courses, they're going to keep staying at the top. And it's the same sort of, I guess, idea that I'm not a fan of, which is basically just um, wherever you happen to be as a, you know, 18 year old coming into college should hopefully not have a huge predictive level on your college success, but it does. And so I feel like it's a major goal to try to um, not undo that in the way of like taking the best students and making sure they don't do well anymore, but hopefully switching things by um, increasing opportunity for the students that didn't have um, as good a preparation coming in. So it also helps students with different learning styles, different backgrounds. And again, let's incorporate more of these group activities and problem solving, critical thinking type activities into class. So um, I am focusing, this one is, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but from more upper level class. And this is one where we actually switched the style of the course in the middle of the semester um, because we had a frank conversation with my students halfway through and said, you know, the first exam was terrible. Um, what can we do different? What can you do different? What can I do different? And this was an invertebrate, um, invertebrate class. And the first part of the course was largely sort of the way I'd taught it before and the way I'd been taught it before, which is largely memorize lots of these structures, you know, what is the third mouth part called on the lobster and that sort of thing, which is, I mean, useful, but um, maybe hard to focus on or um, lacks context, especially in, you know, the, the current setting where I am, we're not producing lots of like marine biology, well, we don't have marine biology majors, we're not producing any marine biology majors. So especially for them, it's really not important if they know what, you know, the third, um, the third like pleopod is functioning as or something like that. Anyway, so the way we refocused it is more on, all right, y'all are going to have to do some work in advance. Um, same sort of thing that I talked about before, but I'm going to record little 15 minute videos. Um, students aren't going to keep their attention on recorded videos for more than about that long, but I'm going to go through it in advance. You're going to have little quizzes on it in advance, and then we're going to focus the class on discussions and group activities and stuff like that. Um, but the deal is the grades have to be good on those mini quizzes and the participation has to be there um, was sort of the, the part I put on them or else we're going to, you know, switch back to the old way. So it ended up working out pretty well, I think. Keep clicking this even though it's not connected to it. And so one of the things I want to um, mention here and promote, I guess, is that one of the things I've focused on for some of the more pedagogical research that I've done is been on like using games to teach concepts. And so I think this would be one of the um, cool opportunities here is to say, okay, this is, I'm not going to get into it too much in the interest of time, but a game we developed and published related to the spread of invasive species and modeling that out and sort of playing that out from a um, policymaker perspective, from a management perspective. And I've done this in intro bio courses, but then at a higher level in an invasive species course. Um, in the intro courses, it's basically they're given, like, I have a bunch of invasive species cards, basically. And I'll say they get to decide how much money they're allocating to preventing and managing invasive species in advance. Then I have a card that says, all right, this, this invasive species has come to your island. How much does it cost you? And then if they didn't do anything to prevent it in advance, then it would spread to the next island, that sort of thing. The more advanced version is they have to research a bunch of different species, look into economic costs, prevention methods, vectors by which they're spreading and all that. And sort of they're developing the cards. Um, we have different climates on different islands. We could play around with like shipping routes and stuff like this. And obviously all of this is a game, but they enjoy like competing with each other to see which island loses the most money or loses the least money. Um, and so if we were able um, at Friday Harbor or through the marine biology program here to have like 
create some of these modules where it's like, this is a great way to teach this topic. That's hopefully something that could be sort of exported to different areas. Um, this is an amazing opportunity with, I mean, I don't know if there's, correct me if I'm wrong, not many marine biology programs larger than this one, which has grown so rapidly. And so we have a huge audience here, not to like experiment on, but I mean, to try to play around with um, like the best ways to most effectively teach some of these concepts. And so if that's something that we can export and be sort of leaders in that, that would be amazing. Um, and then I mentioned the concept focus versus content focus. They don't have to be in conflict with one another, but I think one of the challenges that sometimes we'll deal with when you think about restructuring a course or even changing a course at all is, but how can I fit in the amount of content that we need to cover? And again, I usually default back on, well, how well are they learning it? And if they're learning it really well, then that's great. And it should be left alone. But usually it's based on our just feeling of whether they're learning it or not. And you could look at grades or something like that. But I think being able to assess um, like different means of teaching topics and how effective they are, um, both in a field setting and a lab-based setting through undergraduate research, and look at over a period of time, because we'll have like lots of cohorts and marine biology majors, how effectively are they retaining this and what sort of factors go into that? I think the, the picture here is basically, there's a lot more concrete and other material on the bottom, but it doesn't necessarily make anything and it doesn't necessarily go anywhere. Um, and so I've definitely found, and not pointing the finger out where I'm pointing it inwards, in some of my courses that students will, if it has been memorization heavy, that like by the end of the semester, they're like, oh, I don't remember that. That was way back in week two or something like that. Like, okay, well, great. <laughs> then what was I doing with my time? And so I think the focus here, and one of the reasons that I'm so you know, intrigued by this opportunity is the focus on hands-on research, um, field experience, and getting that incorporated into as many courses as possible, especially at Friday Harbor. It's obviously um, a major part of pretty much every course there. And this has been shown through numerous studies to have disproportionately large impact on first-generation students, students from underrepresented groups, and students whose retention and persistence in the major would otherwise be relatively low. And so being able to incorporate this into as many courses as possible would be um, fantastic. And I, like I said, I have a wide range of experience with different field courses and everything. And because she's here, <laughs> this is Amy, who's in the oceanography program here, who I taught um, many years ago. All right. So, um, the last thing I really wanted to mention was the focus on undergraduate research um, and how that could be incorporated into some of the courses. I know that upper level courses that are, you know, research intensive, like I know some of the um, things are actually like research internships or research experiences. And obviously that's the goal then, if it's the actual course that's intended to have everyone do an independent project. Um, but I'm talking about other types of courses where you could presumably do that. and so. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this really could be anything. This could be a couple weeks. Um, this doesn't have to be a whole term. It doesn't have to be the entire course, but um, typically in a lab setting, when we do this, students will usually propose a project. They'll go through the whole like mini thing as if they're you know a full-on scientist applying for grants and everything. Even if this is gonna be a group project because of the class size, I'll have students come up with individual proposals first. Um, before they get into groups. One reason that I do this is because otherwise when they get into groups for the first time, if nobody's thought of an idea first, usually the group gloms on to whatever the first idea that comes out is. So usually the idea that the most outspoken student has or the most experienced student has is what they go with. If everyone, uh, I'll have everyone come up with two ideas in advance and have a little justification for each. And then if you have a group of four, you come in and you have eight different ideas for research projects already. And sometimes they adopt one and sometimes they come up with some sort of chimera project that's got a bunch of different things. And then they have to put a proposal together as a group with me to review it because you know, not every um, experiment can be done in you know, a short period of time. This is where I've focused, I'll talk about in a second, but some on more like behavioral projects that can be done relatively quickly. Again, this is a hands-on experience that benefits 
well, all students hopefully, but it helps build skills that they would learn with critical thinking, with scientific writing, with communicating to a broad um, range of audiences. And one of the things that I think is important in, from a like recruitment standpoint, I'm at a liberal arts institution right now. This is the sort of stuff we recruit on. And so this is sort of something that University of Washington and Friday Harbor can almost co-op and say, this is, this is our thing. These schools that are saying like, you will get you know, smaller courses and you'll get undergraduate research experience and all this. Again, when we're recruiting now, we're, we're using Penn State as the bad example. Of, um, and we'll say, if you go to Penn State, you are not gonna get meaningful research experience as an undergraduate for the most part, unless you really seek it out. Most students will not, just numerically. Um, and this is the sort of thing we can do. You can hop into this relatively early. And so having this incorporated as much as possible into the curriculum is not only you know, good for student learning, it's good for recruitment, it's good for retention within the major if the students are able to realize, you know, hey, I can do this, I can do actual research, um, even though, I mean, they're not publishing probably something from the short term, but it could be a seed of something larger and more interesting. So uh, I basically just um, said all this already, but I said I've been doing more behavioral research, it builds a lot of skills that are useful, um, again, not only in later courses, but also in their careers. And so some of my um, own sort of disciplinary research has focused more on these behavioral projects. A lot of it has sprung out of student research projects. Um, this is from like last week, presented this at a conference. All the other authors on here are undergraduates um, from sophomores through seniors. And they've all done behavioral components of this research project that's basically found some pretty cool things like these shrimp will approach and harass their predators, which is the only invertebrate that's known to do this. Um, and so it's pretty cool. They also have dominance hierarchies where little shrimp fight with each other to establish ranks. And um, all these unusual behaviors are things that actually can be studied in a really sort of small and modular setting, but have been, they've all come out of undergraduate research projects. And so the last thing that I wanna highlight is just some of the larger scale thoughts and ideas on this. Um, I've had a significant amount of experience with curriculum design stuff from what I mentioned before of restructuring our biology major. I've obviously restructured my courses, I guess I talked about more, but then with individual groups of some of you, I talked about how a couple of us in my department took the lead on basically changing our major from in a couple ways, the biology major from having these sort of memorization heavy zoology and botany courses the first year, which were sort of weed out courses and had about a third of the students would drop out. Um, this is not great from a, um, not great from a diversity perspective, given the demographics of the students who did drop out being disproportionately underrepresented or um, first gen students. It's not great from a um, financial standpoint for the school because not all of them are staying at the institution. And then it's obviously not good for the, um, the major itself because they're going on to other majors, which again, if they're better suited for another major, then great. But if they just leave, if students who would have been successful, if they stuck with it, leave, that's where we're really sort of letting them down a little bit. So we restructured that and also got them into some of these more specialized upper level courses earlier on. Um, also been developing a marine biology minor, even though I'm the only marine biology person in my institution. So that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, and we've recently developed a travel course. I say courses here because um, basically the president of my institution was saying, all right, we're going to do this whole new travel thing. It's going to be free. Students are going to go on these like vacations all over the world, pretty much. And so they convened a working group that um, I led to say, how is this going to work? And we basically said, it's not going to work like that. Um, and so we pulled students and faculty and staff about like what they would do, what they would be most interested in, and sort of brought it back towards courses like faculty. We, so we do now free travel courses um, or a free travel course to anywhere that's abroad. Um, but their courses, because the vast majority of students said they would prefer it to be a course. Almost all the faculty said, like, I'm not going to be a chaperone on a trip where I have no leverage over the students and we're going to Italy or something like that. Um, and so we're able to use that data to sort of drive the way it's going. Um, 
some of it is still out of our hands. It was not does not cover domestic travel, which I'm not thrilled about, but uh, nonetheless, it was um, a great experience to be involved in that. So I think related to the marine biology major, um, I've talked about this with many different groups here and been told this from many different groups, but a major goal is just once it sort of plateaus, especially to a certain number of students um, per year to have some consistency in the curriculum in terms of like knowing what's gonna be offered when at Friday Harbor in particular, so that we can advise students to say, all right, you know, the goal is, I'm just picking a time, but like second quarter or spring quarter of your junior year or something, you're, you can plan to be at Friday Harbor and you can take these courses that'll fulfill these requirements. Um, and we can start planning that from early on to know, um, make Joe's job a lot easier <laughs> instead of saying, maybe some of these courses will be offered. Um, and so hopefully, again, it wouldn't have to be an entire quarter, but hopefully could get some of these early hands-on or um, course-based research projects incorporated into a lot of the courses um, is sort of the, the ultimate goal. And then assess whether, like basically how effective this is, use this potentially as sort of a um, educational research component of it as well. And focused on whether it's large courses that require collaborative work, collaboration across some of the different like um, departments that we have here so that we have students and faculty from the different um, departments offering courses that are related or that link to each other, trying to build skills that students can utilize for careers for other courses. And then I think part of making this all feasible is that integrated field experience that um, is gonna mean that we need to get what 100 or 150 students in each cohort an integrated field experience. So whether that just means like actual independent research project is probably gonna get out of hand pretty quickly. It could be these course-based components, course-based research. It could be group projects. It could be internships. We can build connections to some like local like industries or aqua, I mentioned the grad students aquaculture or something like that um, and have that count as a field experience. But I think sort of trying to think outside the box is a way that students can get this sort of field experience would be useful. So all of this, as I do a fake push one more time here, um, it's just ways that we can create opportunities for um, students in marine biology. And hopefully, I mean, the ultimate goal is Friday Harbor is and should certainly continue to be a, a leader in that. That's all. <laughs> Happy to answer questions if you have them. <laughs> when you phrase it like that, yeah. What are your thoughts on the balance between the upper level courses between teaching concepts and teaching skills? Um, I mean, I don't think it's one or the other. I think that ideally the skills should be something they pick up as they're doing some of these research projects and things like that. So typically the way that I'll structure my courses is that, so um, one of the things that I propose that I'll, I'll be talking more about at the Chalk Talk thing tomorrow is the animal behavior course. And so this has the undergraduate research component, but the first like about half of the course is let's learn this skill as it relates to, so the goal might be predator avoidance or something. And so they'll use the crab snail relationship um, learn about that, learn about sort of predator cues and all that sort of stuff, then do an experiment. They'll use um, time-lapse photography. They'll use um, ImageJ to analyze the movement patterns to track the snails and all that sort of thing. And then the following week, we might have another sort of um, short activity or lab thing that's based on, again, based on the concept or based on something that we were talking about in the lecture or other part of the class. and the skills are sort of like how you can learn more about that concept or about that idea, how you can quantify that. And then about halfway through the course, once they've been introduced to a lot of these different, um, I guess, ways to assess behavior and things like that, then they'll start proposing some of their own ideas. Um, I mean, ideally, when you think about like concepts versus content, again, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Ideally, if they understand the concepts, then learning the like specific content should be easier because again that's one of the I think the great values of field courses is I've seen like with the Oregon course when I first 
when I first tell them, okay, one of the goals, in addition to learning like major tenets of marine ecology, because a lot of these students are like accounting and art majors and stuff like that, is that you're going to memorize or that you're going to learn like 150 different species while you're here in two weeks, in addition to like understanding all these major concepts and everything. And at first, in addition to like theoretically designing a project and conducting it and analyzing it and writing it up. And at first that's like, well, there's no way I can do that. But as soon as you start going to a lot of these different environments and talking about animals by their names and where they live and everything like that and understanding the sort of context of, okay, this is a rocky shore. So these are the types of animals that are there. And we talk about like in this zone, what you should have. Um, usually in, in my experience, the students haven't had much problem at all with the actual like remembering the types of animals and the names and stuff like that. Um, I mean, there, there can be a trade-off in some settings, but I think the sort of field-based part helps with that in a lot of ways that they're able to see um, sort of the, the context should provide an easier way for people to memorize things. You're both in the line. Oh. Yeah, so um, I can speak to the, um, for the invertebrate one, that was more just my own, you know, feeling of which things are most important for each group. For the intro course, there was actually a study, I'm not going to be able to say who it was by, um, but there was a survey of like 400 different college professors on like, what are the things that you think students need to know from an introductory biology course? And so then there was a list of, you know, 85% think that this concept, so like cell cycle is an important thing for them to be able to learn. Then there were other things that are like, they could rate like, um, no, this is not important for them to learn, which is not usually what people are picking, but, or this can be best explained in an upper level course. They don't necessarily need to try to learn a watered down version of it already. Or yes, they really need to understand that, that it can, so that it can be built on in upper level courses. And um, so the, we had a 15 week semester. So the 15 things there, it was like one major concept for each week. And it was based on that study basically that said, um, these are the things I think they should know. Sort of the organization of it was the way that I thought would make the most sense in terms of the order of it and all that. I wasn't just going down a ranked list, like one week we do genetics and then we do ecology and then we do, you know, rest photosynthesis. But um, in terms of picking the concepts that was, the motivation for that one. Um, thanks for a very enlightening talk. Um, I'm very intrigued about your experiences in teaching um, field-based courses, second year and third year. Yeah. And um, I was especially, um, I, I liked your idea of trying to get students to bring these two ideas to the group sure. before you actually decide to mm -hmm. I'm actually curious how you get them to come up with those ideas in the first place in a way that's productive. Mm -hmm. What are the prompts or what are you, how would you, how would you come to them? Right. So this is another, um, I think, value of a field-based course, because if I do this, like if I took a classroom of students who just signed up for animal behavior, like at my current institution, it'd be just, well, I'm teaching in the fall. I'm still there. Um, a bunch of random students with different backgrounds because there's no like prerequisites for it basically it's just whatever and so if I said come up with an experiment to do something related to animal behavior right it would be a, I mean, it'd be a disaster it'd be um, something sort of out of control and ridiculous you know I want to see the effects of microplastics on well that would already be true yeah. be like what effects do oh here's one that get a lot because people think about essential oils a lot for some reason wherever I am <laughs> Like, what is the effect that essential oils have on raccoons or something like that? I'm like, okay, well, it's not logistically feasible. I don't even know what you mean by essential oils. I don't know what your process is. Anyway, so yeah, there's an easy, a lot of them would be unproductive. So basically um, with the field courses in particular, we start thinking about that from the very start. First of all, the concepts that when we first talk, start talking about it, they'll read scientific papers and like highlight different methods and say, okay, we should be thinking about how did they manipulate things in the fields? So we could think about, oh, caging experiments. Um, you could be like looking at feeding experiments in the lab. And so we read papers that have sort of different types of experimental methods. And then the first probably five or six days of the course before we do the project proposal stuff, um, which for the intensive field courses, five or six full days, like all out in the field. Um, 
every time we're going somewhere, every time we're collecting the animals, I'm sort of prompting them to think about that. And so like, oh, this, is, this pattern is interesting. How could you test to figure out like what's causing that? Or one of the other things they have to do is like is common in these types of courses, I guess, is they're making a class field guide. So they're coming back and they're all identifying everything and researching its like diet and what eats it and stuff like that. And so I'm prompting them whenever they see anything that's like unusual or not unusual, but a pattern that they notice in the lab, even like, oh, the sea urchins seem to be covered, like grabbing onto all the shells and algae in the tank. Um, this was me being a sea urchin, putting things on myself. Um, why do you think they're doing that? Could you test that? Could you? And so some groups have said like, all right, let's give them different types of materials. Um, and so, I mean, the goal, hopefully, if we're thinking groups of four and they all have two ideas is that some of them are useful. I also give them feedback on their like two ideas first in the hope that they'll all at least have one that's um, potentially feasible, partly because when you do get into the group setting, it's sort of disheartening for a student if they come with a couple ideas and everyone else is like, no, that's that's not possible. <laughs> and so I like to, with them turning them into me first, give them some like guidance to make sure it's at least feasible. And then we talk a lot about, okay, what can we do in this course? It's a two week course. You're not doing growth experiments. Um, you're not doing like a study on whales because we never see them um, in Oregon. Like. We're not, you need to think about, okay, I, if you want to do something with birds, that's fine, but it's going to be observational. It can't be, you know, you can't be out there like doing stuff to birds um, without permitting and all that. So um, like what sort of things can you do and sort of constraining it from that standpoint? Um, it's admittedly harder the larger the class gets, right? Because I can't be constantly going to everyone in a, you know, 40, 50 person class. Um, at least not in the like lecture setting and say like given having a conversation with them about it. But I think it's a combination of a lot of things, but it definitely takes some some narrowing down and some guidance. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's starting to my thoughts with the flip classroom style. And, okay. And what I found is I had to force them to create a consent of them to watch the lectures and come to the lab. Yeah. But there's like, oh, there's very lecture the lecture, and then very relaxed, and then you have it. Yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts on like how, like, like, I'm just thinking from a student perspective, I'm going to take a four look at them, and all of them have like <laughs> a quiz every second day, and mm -hmm. then them from the lab, and the this and that. Mm -hmm. you know, is, is that too much to expect? Like, all these extra, like, low, low tech quizzes? Um, I think it depends on how the class is structured. If you add it as an extra thing, yes, probably. Like if it's, I'm going to change nothing else about the class, except I'm also going to ask them to watch an hour long video every night and then to, or every other night or whatever, and then take a quiz about it. Um, but nothing else changes. Yeah, that's probably a lot. Um, but if you think about like how much time should a student be spending on X course per week? And if it's, if that number includes like a lot of studying and a lot of um, work to try to prepare for quizzes and exams and stuff like that, if then we're doing things in class that should help them like understand the material better, presumably there should be some savings in time for that. And so I don't think it's completely like just an additive thing to their time. But yeah, I also think like I wouldn't be assigning a lot of also like additional outside of class like do these three assignments and watch this video about especially because right assignments are usually about things you've already covered in the videos or about things you're going to cover and so that could sort of get things muddled up a lot but yeah i mean it logically when you first and i, I sort of went through the same process it's like well obviously if they want to be prepared and they want to learn it they'll just watch it um and then you look at the like page views or whatever. It's like, well, four people out of 70 watch this in advance. So um, yeah, you need some sort of incentive for them to do it. Um, but there's also some, um, I don't know how I'd phrase it exactly, psychological security, I guess, and knowing that though there are those sorts of things that they can go back to as resources if they want to. I say psychological just because the, the data from Canvas, which monitors everything if you didn't know 
you could see how many times every student viewed every page and all that, um, is that they usually don't go back and watch them, but they like the idea that they could. <laughs> and so I don't know if this is good or bad, really, I guess. Um, but I think sometimes students will get stressed out, even if they're keeping up enough to understand a concept, they're getting stressed out like, oh, I think I missed something. What did, what did that last thing covered? So the idea that they could, again, not that everything that they learn in the class is just something they could have watched from the video, um, but I think there's definitely an element of um, their, they like the idea of being able to go back and watch it. And there's also the, the worry and that I've, I've had to deal with as well of, okay, well, some students are probably gonna think, well, if I can just watch or learn the stuff on my own outside of class, why am I gonna come to class? And you might get attendance drop off in that regard. And so that's why I think the in-class activities have to be, I think, have to clearly demonstrate their value either through like points for an in-class activity or just, um, I mean, not everything on the quizzes or exams and things like that is from the outside of class materials either. So I think if you did entirely have everything based on like the videos they could have watched outside of class, then I think some students will probably just treat it as an asynchronous class where they don't come, especially if it's eight o'clock in the morning from personal experience. Is there any other I would also say that most of the more opportunities 